Welcome, welcome, welcome to 2024. Delighted to have you all back. And thank you for waiting a few minutes. So I just have found that if I start right on time, then people are still rolling in for a few minutes. We get lots of bings, bings, bings. So thank you so much. Um, I'm Dr. Deborah Green. Of course, I'm the co-host with Felicia Menta from the JPA. And uh, we're delighted to be back up and running for 2024. And a uh, couple of things is that, um, you know, we did shift our time to 1 p.m. And uh, Felicia and I were both talking about for a Monday, it just feels a lot more manageable uh, at 1 o'clock than 11 a.m. So um, hope you like the, the change in time, too. Um, We've had to adjust periodically because of Monday holidays. And so that's why we're the second Q&A is um, not on the second Monday, <laughs> it's on the third. And um, a couple of things then too, is that the, the program is being recorded. So there will be a recording link sent out to everybody who is pre-registered, or just all of you. And um, uh, I will say I, and our apologies for the late notice. Normally we get that out the week before and uh, things happened and it didn't go on. So um, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and just review with you, uh, we think are some pretty exciting topics. Uh, some are definitely based on um, uh, legal issues being handled in higher courts, um, while uh, a couple have come up just because of recent cases that we've been I'm gonna go ahead and make sure everybody's mute unless you're going to speak. So. Um, there we go, thank you. Yeah, because this is being recorded, so we want to have a clean recording and uh, go on from there. Okay, so the four things uh, we thought we'd talk about because we see this time and time again. How much leave is too much leave? And um, and see you whenever, you know? And I think all of us uh, seeing uh, the participants on here, uh, we've all dealt with this at some point. And so we'll give you some examples of what the EEOC has said, but also a little bit about the details because we have two cases that are uh, similar but very different outcomes. And so just like we always say, a case-by-case -case evaluation, right? And then number two, another decree from the EEOC, uh, UPS is in trouble again. And so, uh, you know, even the very big companies make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so we'll take a look at um, how did they get into trouble once again? And then the third one is not so much uh, case driven, uh, but it definitely is um, can create some problems uh, when we you know fall into the trap of medical delays, and oftentimes that might come from uh, through the workers' compensation system because, as we know, uh, it's a system that moves very slowly and uh, doesn't help us manage our employees getting back to work, which sort of ties back into the leave. And, um, and the impact it has on accommodation efforts. In fact, I have a, a situation just from this morning that I can share with you the dilemma. And we should probably haven't had a chance to see the email yet on that one, but, um, uh, but it also sort of ties into when we have these overlapping worlds between the workers' compensation system and requirements versus our um, needs to comply with the ADA and FEHA. And then lastly, who's in charge? <laughs> so it's sort of like when well, you know, the right hand know what the left hand's doing. Um, but, you know, our, we wanted to share with you some thoughts um, about roles and responsibilities in managing employees with medical conditions. And um, again, some of the uh, you know, nuances that can really make it work well, and then also some of the pitfalls uh, when we don't have a well-oiled operation. Okay, so without further ado, Let's get rolling here. We'll go, um, we're gonna try to manage our time a little bit uh, better than maybe in the past. Uh, it's easy to get carried away with our topics, but um, my goal is that we will be um, done by a quarter of two, okay? About 45 minutes rather than going a full hour. So how much leave is too much leave? So what, um, I'm gonna talk a little generally and then Felicia's gonna get into some of the details. But one of the things I want to emphasize um, as does the EEOC, the word indefinite. Anytime there is no end date, anytime it's you know, indefinite or cannot be decided, um, that's a trigger where we need to start pulling on the range, shall we say. Um, the EEOC has been very clear in a number of different cases that as an employer, you are not responsible for accommodating unpredictable, unexpected, absences or indefinite leave. 
And uh, the, the ruling that we want to share with you talks all about that. So Felicia, let's go ahead and dive into the details and then we'll wrap up this particular piece about five key tips. Great. Um, yeah, I love the title of the CEOC case was I'll be back whenever. <laughs> What's the time limit for leave as disability accommodation? Some of you have experienced this that I've, I've talked to recently. So this case um, started in 2017. This employee, Colleen, was age 61, and she was hired to lead an oncology department at the this regional medical center in Missouri. So big responsible job. Three months later, they hired a new COO uh, to be her boss, Patrick, and he became her direct supervisor. Uh, the two did not get along well, and that's an understatement, and he presented her a coaching document, um, and she went to HR saying uh, that that was a toxic work environment and that he was bullying her, and then um, the he then issued her a warning. He wrote her up a performance improvement plan, and then a few days later, he gave her a final warning of possible termination. And then five days later, after receiving that final warning, she requested short-term disability leave as an accommodation. This leave stretched out, and this is off work completely with an off work note, um, for nine months. And so no more back and forth between her and her supervisor because she's not there. So HR asked her when... Um, her doctor was going to release her to return to work or what was the time frame, or just an update on what's happening. And this is again, nine months of being off work. And she said, um, I don't have any, you know, update for you. The doctor just has me off work indefinitely to use your word. Right. Mm -hmm. um, she, so then um, HR terminated her and she sued in court alleging a hostile work environment based on her age, 61, and um, under ADA for her disability. And interesting facts in this case, the federal court ruled for the employer, for the regional medical center, saying that she was not terminated based on her age, but because she refused to provide updated information and any kind of date that she thought she could return to work. And, um, they did comment on the ADA portion of her suit, saying that accommodation does not mean that you get indefinite leave. So uh, I thought it was an interesting case because this case was not found for the employee, whereas the other case that we're going to go into was. Um, but um, it very much speaks to this indefinite leave. And then it led to the, you know, kind of five quick tips uh, to help, right? Right, right. Yeah, that um, uh, couple of key points there. And um, one of the things that I always try to do as a facilitator of the IPM process is make it very clear to the employee and the employer. The employer has responsibilities and obligations. The employee has responsibilities and obligations. And so one of those is one staying in communication with your employer. Um, just because you're not at work doesn't mean you're out of sight. Um, and then, and two is that yes, there is a requirement um, that they do provide medical documentation unless it's something so evident. Um, for example, I, I, you know, like I, a new employee was hired using a wheelchair, and it wasn't. I mean, the need for the wheelchair was evident, but the need for accommodation wasn't as clear. She could do all the work but there were access issues that we had mm. to address and, and how to streamline things like that. So again, generally rule of thumb, medical documentation required, unless it's just so evident, you know, and that's, that's actually very rare uh, when it's so evident like that, um, that you wouldn't need medical documentation. And then uh, two is again, uh, you know, companies will have different policies and things like that. Um, you know, some will have a, I think the other case that UPS got into trouble with a couple of years ago was that they did have, you know, if you were off of work on, for one year, then they had the right to go ahead and terminate you. Now, and they had the right to do that, okay? However, you have to take things case by case. And so they had an employee who was approaching one year, let them know that she needed another 30 days or something like that. And they went ahead and fired her anyway. 
And uh, in that case, the employee did win because it was very clear that she only needed 30 more days and, uh, and it was no longer indefinite. And so the EEOC actually did put a statement out at that time that, you know, yeah, you can have your policies, you know, about things like this. Um, and yet, if, you know, somebody's requesting more time, well, how much time? And they said, you know, if you're going quite a long time, like 180 days, which we oftentimes work with, or if your policy is a year, if someone needs something that's finite um, and concrete, like 30 days or 60 days, okay, work with them, you know, if, if they're that close to being able to recover. Um, but 90 days start stretching it. If somebody's already been off a year and now they're wanting another 90 days, that's a pretty long time. And, and that's where we're going to get into a, the whole notion about undue hardship or burden for the employer. We'll come back to that. So Felicia, what's the other case that turned a very different way? Yeah, so the facts on the, the um, EEOC, um, UPS is in trouble again. What happened in this case is the employee was hired as a preloader for UPS, which you can imagine that's preloading and getting all the packages ready to go into the trucks. And this was in a um, Florida warehouse and the employee had an underlying condition of diabetes. So even though this is a non-industrial condition, as you guys know, um, the industrial and the non-industrial uh, disabilities are all impacted by your return to work policy and, we, and all have accommodation issues with them. So he, this uh, gentleman wore an insulin pump with a continuous glucose monitor. And he asked his supervisor for an occasional about less than five minute break in between loading the trailers, the trucks, so he could check his blood sugar and maybe eat or drink something if his blood sugar levels were off or a little bit low, if that was necessary. And even though he was able to perform all the other essential functions of the job, um, HR, the HR supervisor referred to him as a liability due to his disability. And then after his second day on the job, the HR manager fired him. And EEOC sued UPS for, violation, for violating the ADA. And UPS denied the allegations um, and said that they you know, didn't feel that they violated the ADA. But after litigation proceeded on in this case, uh, they agreed to settle to avoid further litigation. So obviously it didn't go all the way to court with a finding, but they they felt that the settlement was fair. So it tells me they knew that there were problems, right? They agreed to settle. Um, UPS was um, agreed to pay $150,000 um, to settle the case. And they also agreed to reinstate the employee that they fired after the second day on the job. And then what EEOC insisted on as part of the settlement was that um, they had to um, they had to train all of the supervisors and managers on the interactive process meeting about accommodating and discussing disability that we don't refer to people as liabilities um, because of their disabilities and that you must consider IPMs anytime somebody, he was requesting an accommodation, right? These breaks were his request for an accommodation, even if it wasn't handled as such. And that all managers and supervisors had to have uh, mandatory training. And that was in addition to the $150,000 um, settlement. So I thought that that was um, kind of interesting on the guidance on the accommodations and then requiring the HR training because HR is the part of the company that fired him, not his direct supervisor. So very interesting. Yeah. Oftentimes the EEOC decisions, when it gets to that level, um, will order uh, or organizations undertake um, massive training uh, for all mid-level uh, and up managers, not just HR, uh, to make sure that people are um, informed and uh, responsible in how they manage employees' medical conditions in the workplace. And this applies to a lot of other things. I used to do a lot of training um, uh, with an, organ an HR organization who specialized in uh, responding to EEOC orders like that. And we um, were about 20 years, I did a lot of diversity training uh, in response to discrimination uh, lawsuits 
in the longshore industry and in the airline industry um, as far as um, uh, you know, discrimination for, for gender and uh, race and things like that. So training is very often, and then also etiquette, uh, speech etiquette, you know, again, mm -hmm. liability and, you know, and so forth. So, uh, yeah, so really important. And so for everybody out there, um, uh, you know, I took over from my predecessor, for those of you who know her, Judy Lem, uh, but she used to provide a lot of training. I do a lot of training. And so have a nice little compact hour program uh, that uh, is designed for um, supervisors and managers uh, and directors so that they have an idea of how to handle these things. So that I know, Felicia, you and I have both encountered where things have been handled at the local level, mm -hmm. not at the district level um, right. or the HR level, and, and sometimes very inappropriate accommodations, uh, very prolonged accommodations, which sort of mm -hmm. tied into our next type, um, topic. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, and in fact, I have I have a case just from uh, Friday that was very interesting. I'll, hopefully, we'll have a chance to, to um, tap into There was a little um, addition that I forgot to add that EEOC just put a caveat at the bottom is that to remember that about requesting breaks, if someone works an eight-hour day and they have a one-hour lunch um, and that, that they, you know, that's mandatory, it is still can be reasonable as an accommodation to give them one or two other break times, either the 15 minutes that some people have built in, um, and then have them make up some time later on that you can be flexible, but just to say no breaks for any reason, uh, this example is diabetes, but I can think about lots of our work comp cases where they need a break to ice their arm. They need a break to get off their feet. I think of these break things as something that we encounter all the time as a request for accommodation. Right, right. And uh, a, a quick example on that one, um, and I think you might remember this case, Felicia, uh, you know, by California law, uh, employers are required to provide a 15 minute break after two hours of work, a 30 minute lunch after four hours of work. And so um, in this particular case, so the limitation was that the employee needed a 15 minute break every two hours. And the employee thought it was 15 minutes in addition to her 15 minute oh. break. Mm -hmm. It was like, no, and, you know, 15 minutes is 15 minutes. And so if you're mm -hmm. already getting a break, that accommodation's already been met. Uh, just by the nature of another state law, yeah. And um, and then two is uh, I have seen cases where we've been creative and flexible and so complying with state laws around breaks and lunch breaks by giving up the breaks differently mm -hmm. uh, so that you know, if an employee needed to, to um, like say, needed to do something every hour, for example, well then we'd, we'd take five minutes. You know, again, it would have to be if it's appropriate for the work setting as well. And so, um, so again, part of this is flexibility Hi. in how Hi, we can look I get at a breakfast things. burrito? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah, a lot of a lot of different examples. But you know, what happens when we, we have these medical delays and it just drags on things forever? And so um, uh, and so Felicia, I know that you have a, a particular example that you'd like to share, and I have a, um, um, also one that I think it would be interesting around this topic. Yeah, so um, this is a, a, a real example. We just obviously won't name um, the employee or the district, but this is kind of an interesting, uh, complicated, I'll say, work comp injury with a custodian who had a knee injury, and um, the doctor uh, determined that he was in need of, I believe, a total knee replacement. So it's a pretty serious knee injury. But because the employee weighs 370 pounds, which would be considered obese um, in the medical field, he could not um, have the surgery because he couldn't medically clear. So that kind of puts you in this weight line, you know, in comp, and it would do the same thing in a non-industrial case too. So the doctor told him he needed to lose weight, right? Well, he needs to lose a lot of weight, right? In order to have total knee, you need to really um, get down, you know, a little above, you know, 200 and such. So it was a lot, right? The weight loss needed to be like 150 pounds. Um, and he was put on a weight loss program or he was working with a weight loss program. And then he was provided temporary accommodated duty in an alternative position, not in his current position as a custodian, but placed somewhere else. 
Um, and then they hired, the district hired a subcustodian to fill his job. This particular district, because all of you I know have different policies on your return to work, but this particular district has 60 plus 60 to a maximum of 120 days of temporary accommodated duty. And um, this employee was put off last year in the 22-23 school year and then continued. He kind of just fell between the cracks, kind of. Nobody met with him. Nobody was counting the days. And then this year, up until now and current, he continued to be off on this accommodated position. When the site said, hey, you know, this sub has been in this position for so long, what is happening? That's when we went and talked about medical delays because the doctor had not made him um, permanent and stationary yet with permanent disability, with permanent work restrictions, with the need for future medical for his surgery, because he can't medically clear now, but he might clear in the future and then he could come back and have the surgery. And that's probably, that's what we're working on with the doctor to achieve that. But what happened was the district was waiting kind of for the work comp situation, the medical situation to resolve. And we should never, we shouldn't be doing that, right? The return to work track is going on while the work comp track is going on and days are being counted. And the person who's the return to work coordinator knows when they've exceeded that 120 days. And we're talking about what are we going to do? Where are we at? What's happening with the notes? I think this particular employee just thought that, he was going to be able to stay in the alternative position forever, right, for however long, and that his claim could just remain open while he was waiting to medically clear. And then when we were able to talk about it, then we're taking the steps on the comp claim to tell the doctor, look, you know, he's having a very difficult time losing this much weight. It's very difficult, right? It can take a very long time. Let's just make him permanent and stationary so that the district can have permanent work restrictions. And then the district is going to meet with him, hold an IPM, right, to try to clarify where we're at um, with his medical condition. But I do think I see this a lot where because they have a delay in the work comp case, then everything somehow gets delayed over on the return to work track. Right, right. And I think we, um, you know, several um, sessions ago, we talked about, uh, you know, at the beginning of school, at the end of school um, seasons to do a review of mm -hmm. your employees that you know have medical conditions, both work-related and non-work-related. Um, take a look at how long have they been off and, and, and things like that. And I know at the time I emphasized that uh, particularly when there are a couple of things, it gets into, you know, prolonged leave. It also gets into, you know, chronic conditions. Uh, but when somebody is, uh, has met the, the, well, let's say somebody has been absent so significantly that they don't even meet the criteria for FMLA protection. They have not worked enough hours in the prior year for protection in the current year. And so by being aware of someone's particular chronic conditions, um, really important uh, to take a look at, you know, maybe this person really is too medically unable to work given this consistent pattern of, of um, uh, inability to attend work uh, consistently. And, um, and we need to get real about some of the options. I just had a case like that. We tried to accommodate for over three years. She um, barely met 50%, which is way less than the FMLA um, threshold. Mm -hmm. And yet she'd always get a note to come back. And uh, just when she's about ready to exhaust the 100 days. And, um, but this, this had now become a pattern for three years and consistent. And so uh, took steps to, you know, we're trying to work with uh, her about attendance because um, performance was obviously impacted. Uh, attendance as part of the performance was impacted. And, um, and yet if we know of, of a medical condition, we have to try to work through the accommodation process. But at this point, we actually end up with the fitness for duty uh, because of this pattern of medical notes. And, um, and actually the employee ended up um, you know, um, uh, terminating uh, you know, because she knew she couldn't handle, there was nothing to document her medical condition, but she was not handling uh, you know, her attendance to performance and she would have gotten fired probably in the very near future because um, she wasn't able to correct her situation that was more personal than anything else. So um, that sort of ties over into several things as far as you know, ongoing leave, delays in, in practices and things like that. 
Um, I know there's so much more that both of us could say about that. Um, but yeah, it's really important uh, to, again, particularly when we've got um, delays in the workers' comp system, well, what are your other alternatives? And I'll share mm -hmm. with you an example that um, just came up today, but also has been in a number of other cases. As we know, the workers' compensation system moves slowly. And mm -hmm. so we had an employee at the beginning of the school year that um, complained of you know, neck pain right after school got started, filed the claim. Uh, and uh, she also sought some of her own uh, medical care. Then uh, for a reason I don't know, the claim got denied. Uh, but we had these limitations for her neck condition that um, uh, we were working with through ergonomics. And then, then she went off on FMLA for what she considered to be stress related because her claim had been denied and all this. So we, this is still going on. But now she's a teacher, she's been off of work and um, we need to start making some plans about you know, the, you know, the ongoing sub uh, teaching you know, kids and the impact it has on their instruction. And so it turns out that the, the, the work comp stuff is still going through uh, its process, it's gonna be going to a QME sometime in the near future, but then we know it's gonna be another 30, maybe 45 days to get those results. But meanwhile, we still have this one limitation that we know cannot be accommodated. Um, and, uh, and yet she has been treating under her own personal care. And so we tried to get creative about, okay, well, how can we, workers' comp is workers' comp, but we're still dealing with this return to work issue. And so by her own report, she um, has improved a lot with physical therapy that she's been paying for through her healthcare policy. Uh, and so now we're, she's going to work with us, so fortunately, to go to her personal care physician uh, to, to try to get an, an update on what's happening for her next so we can try to get her back to work. Uh, but this is where, you know, we, we, could, we couldn't wait for the workers' comp thing right. because it's been under, um, you know, denial and, and so forth. So, you know, coming up with other solutions. And this right. is also, I know we've talked about fitness for duty. It's just sometimes where fitness for duty might come into play mm -hmm. when the employer's um, expense, but it's all about the return to work element, not the workers' compensation claim. Mm -hmm. Right. Different issues, but very, very confusing because you're right in workers' comp, they say, well, wait a minute, fit for duty is outside the work comp system, but we still can get one, you know, if we still need information on the return to work status. And an employee certainly never has to go to their group health doctor to see them for a work comp claim, but they can if they want to, right? Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. have they have that benefit available to them if they would like to. And those doctors can address return to work. As we all know, all notes come in from all sources from all doctors. Yes, we do know that, yes. Yeah, and so again, the ADA does you know, allow for employers to one, request medical documentation. So like in that first case, Felicia talked about, um, you know, I'm not gonna provide a note. Well, sorry, that doesn't, that's not how it happens here. Um, and then two is that you have the right to seek independent medical evaluation of an employee's ability to work. And it's all within your scope of doing that. If it means keeping the person working, with or without accommodation, et cetera. And I've seen more fitness for duties come up actually in this last year or two than I mm -hmm. have in the prior yes. years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I just got notified this morning that somebody who had very significant limitations in October, you know, and at MMI now is released to full duty <laughs> as of mm -hmm. tomorrow. It was like, whoa, mm -hmm. what happened here? You know? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're looking at uh, the fitness for duty. Running out of leave probably, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so it is just really important to, to evaluate what's going on and, um, and uh, where we can get information and, and just be very cautious about not being locked into just what mm -hmm. the workers compensation system is doing, because right. that's a whole different process. That's about, you know, um, treatment for an injury. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, we know about the um, uh, notice of offer if an offer is made, but also the retraining monies. And so, but it's not really about returning to work. <laughs> so, yeah. And questions on return to work really aren't for the claims adjuster and the claims supervisor. They, they always go in that direction, but they're really for you and I, because they're not, they really fall under the ADA and EEOC and FIHA, which the work comp adjusters are not trained in and do not know about the perils of, and the EEOC cases and kind of where the EEOC is already 
already said they're going to go this year is that they're going to go look at ADA and more and more. They already said in the out front with Mark and, and Kimberly, um, that's what they were saying that the EEOC plans in 2024 to be really addressing how employers are um, dealing with their uh people with a disability. So I feel like just because the disability arises out of work comp, that's more a coincidence. That's mm -hmm. not, that doesn't mean that that's the structure of the return to work and claims examiners don't monitor that process or those laws. Right. Well, as, as another um, um, uh, fact to it, I guess, um, because I have done a lot of mediation around Title VII protections, disability being one of them. Uh, I was speaking at an employment mediation in, uh, conference back in August. And so I thought, well, let me provide some updated stats. I wonder you know, how, how, how familiar people are of, of this. And so you know, a lot of employment attorneys and you know, people related to work. And um, uh, I was actually a little surprised too, because we oftentimes think of discrimination and harassment you know, being, you know, with, um, related to race or ethnicity mm -hmm. age, right? or age. And actually, um, those are very low compared to number one, retaliation, mm -hmm. where an employee feels that the employer is doing something uh, in retaliation for having maybe filed a workers' comp claim, for example. Um, number two was disability. Mm -hmm. and, and so retaliation, I think, was like 53, 54% of all claims filed before EEOC and disability was 47. And the numbers have been going up over the years. And so, um, and, and it seems, I mean, I like to say we at all, we all of us at some point will have a medical condition that impacts our life. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's something that's um, not foreign to anybody. And, uh, and I've seen a lot of change in attitude um, uh, by employers towards employees with medical conditions too. Uh, and so that's good, uh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Less bias, less attitude. And um, uh, because it is an evolving world. And we know from COVID, you know, that we have so many other kinds of medical conditions that have evolved, work-related or not, mm -hmm. that we are now contending with that I never saw before in my many mm -hmm. years of doing this, I'm sure with you too, Felicia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, the last piece that we have is who's in charge, roles and responsibilities. And so uh, I know from my perspective, and I know Felicia, you'll know this even more, but uh, every district manages things a little bit differently yeah. in terms mm -hmm. of where it's housed. And so mm -hmm. I'd like you to share a little bit more about that. So uh, the return to work coordination piece, um, we see it housed sometimes in risk. Uh, that makes sense, right? Because they're handling um, the workers' comp claims. And, and that's sometimes where work comp lives and is in risk. And they're handling maybe property and liability and because liability claims obviously are where any problems with this return to work piece, ADA, EOC are going to fall. And then we also see um, the workers comp piece live in HR, which makes sense, right? Because you're doing IPMs with the non-industrial people as well. Um, and the one thing I could say about wherever you house it is there needs to be someone, a person who owns it. They wear the return to work hat. They may have a supervisor or manager that they go to when they have questions or when they're not sure, but that person, it, everyone in the district knows that that's the person that wears the return to work hat and they're the ones that gets all the notes. Um, it can't always be industrial or non-industrial because as you know, Deborah, some districts break it up. Workers' comp is at risk and the non-industrial is in HR. And then they just need to work closely together. And sometimes they have a Chinese wall because they don't want, they, they want a wall between the communication, you know, to, to kind of keep that uh, walled up between the two. And so I do think that whoever that person is that's in charge of the um, return to work coordination for the industrial injuries that they, you know, they work in really close collaboration, obviously, with the claims team on the notes um, and all of that. And the one thing I have seen some districts do that I really like, and I don't know, um, Deborah, if you've seen this do, where they'll have um, a document that uh, they give to the injured workers right in the beginning that talks about some of the district's policies, the district's policies per se on taking time off to go to appointments, um, which is not covered as you guys know for work comp um, injuries. 
by workers' comp and whether or not that's paid out of your industrial leave or whether that's paid out of sick leave, whether that's docked. It's, it's nice for these things to be clear. Well, I've also seen some districts have their policies very clear, whether their policy is 90 days or 60 plus 60 or 90 plus 90 to 180, that their whether it's their district policy, their board policy, or their board approved return to work program, all the supervisors and managers are familiar with this policy and with the leave and with the times because um, with a lot of districts changing staff and a lot of people um, retiring and new people coming in, I've seen a lack of clarity sometimes on what our policy actually is and who is the person who is actually counting the days so that we even know where we're at, right? Whereas Grossmont does the 90 plus 90 to 180. They do the, the longest this return to work policy that I've seen anyway with the six months. I don't know if you've seen longer than that, um, Deborah, but that's about the longest I've seen. But there is one individual who is doing the counting of that time. Now, that lives in risk. So that reports up to business services in that particular district. So then HR would be doing the non-industrial uh, return to work. We consider your return to work program applying the same to your non-industrial illness, MS, cancer, all of those things, and your workers' comp. So then there would be two return to work coordinators, I guess, one doing the non-industrial stuff, bringing them back to work, temporarily accommodating, and then one doing the workers' comp. And then at a lot of districts, it's just one person and they're doing the non-industrial because it lives in HR and there is a person. Now they may have other people that assist them, but what I have seen recently, there'll be four or five people that are kind of responsible for the return to work program. And that's a little bit too many. Then sometimes things fall between the cracks. One person doesn't know who's actually following up on those people. You just want to tighten up the processes a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like too many cooks in the kitchen, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I know I was uh, shaking my head when you asked me the question that maybe not everybody saw that, but in response to your, your um, question about um, return to work programs longer than 180 days. And my answer is no. Um, I've tried to find the citation uh, uh, more recently, um, but you know, I've been doing this since ADA passed, so, um, but I, and I used to confer with the EOC directly on a lot of situations that were not defined, et cetera, but they really recommend 180 days um, is really about max uh, in terms of the return to work and so forth um, for a few reasons, um, but most importantly is that, you know, you know, I always recommend, you know, a, a temporary leave of absence or a temporary accommodation whenever possible. Uh, it's not easy, but 90 days is usually considered doable. So that 60 to 90 day time frame. And I'm going to emphasize this again because um, uh, it gets missed a lot. You know, if you're doing temporary accommodation, modified work or alternative work, please avoid continuing a temporary accommodation if there's no improvement. If the employee is maintaining status quo and the same limitations um, and they haven't gotten better in 60 or 90 days, they're probably not going to get better in the next 60 to 90 days. Work, working may actually be adverse to their recovery. And so making sure that you evaluate at that 60 or 90 day period of temporary accommodation before you just, that's the thing I see a lot, they just are automatically extended. And so it goes back to that example that you provided, Felicia, nobody was checking, nobody was monitoring. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, and I think you've already commented on this, uh, you know, regardless of where your programs are housed, like if one is in risk, for example, and one is in human resources, make sure that your processes are the same. Make sure that your timeframes for temporary accommodation. Um, I was working with SeaWorld before the um, pandemic and it was amazing. Their workers' comp was managed entirely different than their non-workers' comp in terms of accommodations. And I brought to their attention there had been a case about inconsistent employer practices, and just by that alone was disparate treatment. Mm -hmm. And so there were some real legal and financial com uh, complications um, by not talking together. And so um, one of the the other thing I'll just mention because it falls under the Title VII protections is that you know, what we're talking about medical conditions, there are other forms and issues that come up under Title VII. 
at the federal level. Um, you know, for example, the uh, interactive process could be used for religious accommodation. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't realize that. Or if there's if there service are service animals, right? Service animals. On, on I've seen a couple of cases of domestic violence where both people work at work with the same work, and now there's issues of domestic violence. So that's another thing: is how do we create safety protections? Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing too is that you know this whole um, we brought it up before. You know, etiquette and um, uh, you know allegations of discrimination around disability or and things like that. Uh, the people like in risk and human resources and even sometimes you know, compliance should be tied in uh, as far as communicating about their practices and some of the issues that they face. Um, I just have a recent situation where we had to keep the employee focus. We're here about the medical side. You may have felt you were discriminated or whatever. In fact, she felt that her employer should have been um, uh, making a younger person or a male do the parts for a job she was having difficulty with. So, whoa, that's a whole other level of discrimination there, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, not only for her, but also for the other employees. And so um, it is something we are referring to compliance uh, because of these uh, allegations of discrimination and what she feels is harassment and not being appreciated for the work that she has done now that she's been injured. So it's a, it can be a complicated web. Uh, but make sure that those people who are managing um, these programs, um, you know, are, are staying in communication. So the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. And so however that might be done in, in your situation, we, um, your particular district would be very important. Yeah. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. We're at our time. And um, uh, I, I tend to find all of you as a quiet group. Don't get any questions in the chat box. But you know, know that we're all, both Felicia and myself are always available to reach out and get a different perspective or what would you think about this? Um, we do this regularly with each other as well as uh, uh, with um, districts directly. And so again, the whole idea is to, to bring to light, uh, to expand your education about uh, the simplicity and the complexity of managing medical conditions in the workplace. And uh, hope that you find this uh, helpful. Again, the recording will be sent out to you probably within the week. And I'm also going to include um, some of these other things directly around the five key tips on uh, lead management and things like that. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Felicia, again, for your time and energy. We will be talking to you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Stay dry, stay yes. safe, and stay warm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, be well. <laughs>